Hey, everybody, welcome back to another edition of DPH Clinical. I got the guys from Colorado Surgical Institute, Dr. Dan Brisky and Dr. Tahir Dune. What's happening, brothers? How are you? Good, good, man. How about yourself? Doing good. Can't complain. How about you, Brisky? How's life? What's up, homie? Cheers. It's going really well. <laughs> I have some friends that are flying in in about an hour, and we're going to go skiing this weekend. And yeah, just like every weekend. So nice. Uh, I love Colorado. Yeah, Colorado's amazing. But don't move here. Everyone listening, don't move here. It's too crowded. <laughs> that's, that's why everyone in Colorado is like, all these people coming in here. You see, we don't have that problem in Chicago. Everyone that's like in Chicago is from here. Nobody moves here. Everyone moves away. And then we just like, <laughs> we just have just enough procreation going on to keep the population the same, I think. I don't think anyone migrates here. <laughs> We've got to repopulate our cold, barren, windy wasteland of Chicago, Illinois. When did we get to a brave new world? <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, let's talk about sedation and IV and stuff. And I guess like I'll just open up with just asking a question. This is something I think a lot of people are like, yeah, this would be cool, but I'm slightly scared of the risk. So why don't we why don't you just open up, just talk about like the risk of it, because I think that's what kind of turns people off. They're like, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I have the stomach for it. A selection is, is the most important thing. Like, so for me, I've been doing oral sedation for 10 years, IV sedation for a year and a half or two years, kind of plus or minus. And then if we touch base on the ability to control the sedation, the IV sedation to control is obviously a little bit more effective. You have direct line access, but more so than not, it's like, why, why would you even want to do sedation in your practice, right? There's like a huge population of patients who have anxiety who just maybe even need a form of relaxation. And so depending upon the, the listener and what state you're in, it's going to dictate, you know, what you can do and what you can't do. Generalized topics are, you know, people just want some kind of sedation. If you're doing larger, longer procedures, it's a practice builder, number one. Number two, it will absolutely increase your internal referrals, your reputation within the community as the person who can offer this type of procedure. Number three, it allows you to do more work per patient. So then your productivity per hour goes up. You're not going and moving from room to room to room to hit the same productivity. You're doing more quadrants of dentistry because some of the verbiage I use is like, look, I don't want to sedate you six separate times to do all this. Like, hey, if we're going to sedate you, let's go ahead and try to do as much as you can in one sitting. Next part is uh, you pre-collect the finances. I mean, there's, there's a mentality shift that's different within the patients where they have no problem pre pay for the entire thing if they're going to be sedated versus the old school thought process of, hey, just bill me later, doc. And so it's an easy way to pre-collect. Your cancellations are far less because people have made provisions within their lives to actually show up to that appointment. They've talked to their spouses. They've talked to their bosses. They've talked to everyone to make sure that everything is set up appropriately. And then it allows you to add more procedures to the mix, you know, like wisdom teeth and implants and other stuff too. Because parents back in their day, oral surgeons did wisdom teeth. They were sedated. You know, you can talk to the parents about like, hey, we don't have to deeply sedate your kid, but we do sedation here and we can take out wisdom teeth. And wisdom teeth, are, we, like we've talked about in the past, is low-hanging fruit to add to the practice. Dune and Paul, what do you guys think is the average production of a dentist in the nation? Average daily or hourly? Monthly. Net production for an average dentist what do you think it is i'm gonna go with about yeah i'm gonna say about 45k an office yeah maybe a dentist 30 yeah you're like spot on dude it's like 45k but if anyone that's listening you want an, uh, an easy way to boost your production from 45k to up to 70 is you learn sedation because none of us really want to poke our patients multiple times i'd rather i feel way better having someone come in and doing all of their work because a lot of patients are used to having the single tooth dentistry and there's nothing more frustrating than having single tooth dentistry done as a patient because what happens is that allows them to think more insurance driven in their mindset in terms of you know the small things once a year rather than just getting everything that they need done. And I think it's a way better service to the patient because at that point you're allowing them to finish all their work and have not things get worse or lose teeth or things turn the root canals or right i'd rather get them in hygiene and start running them through hygiene rather than saying oh man nancy hey you know that tooth that's been bothering you your taxes came around maybe you should take care of that one right mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you know it, it's true because like even me as a dentist and who's someone who's not scared of the dentist i'm not so sure i really want to be 
in a chair for six or seven hours awake or doing multiple that many. If I had a big treatment plan to do, I would much rather just go to sleep for it. I mean, I, I, I feel like even I had to get a crown because I split a tooth, man, two years ago. And I mean, it wasn't like bad, but I kind of just would much rather just want to sleep and wake up. You know, it's like it's such a great service to offer people. And I do not do IV sedation. I do oral. Yeah, I understand like the control that you get with IV. It, it's a great service. How about the patients? I mean, so thankful. Such a different demographic of people. Yeah, patients love it, right? For example, myself, there's no way in hell someone's going to take out my tooth unless I'm sedated for it, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, my dad's my dentist and I have enough anxiety getting dental, dental work done. So, oh my gosh, what a what an opening for allowing patients to get work done. Yeah, I'll share a story and, and maybe the listeners will think this is too much information or maybe you will as well. But when I got my vasectomy, I was not sedated. I was not, I wanted to be put out. And I'm just like, I'm like, he's like, it's no big deal. Nobody does it. Nobody gets put out. And it's kind of the same as we do at the dentist. Oh, just one tooth. You know, it's just a root canal. It's, we, we don't put you out for this. And I guess I was sedated. I did take some Valium, but I was, I was awake for it. And it was, it was okay, but it was kind of weird too. I mean, there's this giant plume of like Hiroshima, like smoke coming out of my, you know what? And, and they're just like, he's like, oh, it's no big deal. Want to see what I just chopped out of you? I'm like, no. And he's like, look at this. And I'm like, dude, this is messed up. But I came in there all screwed up off of Valium. But I mean, that's, I guess I was fairly sedated, but I couldn't even imagine doing that completely sober. And, and the thought that we expect our patients to do this, which there's so much more fear going into it. It's, it's such a good service to offer. So to here, let, let's, let's jump back to you, man. How hard is this stuff to learn how to do? So oral sedation, not hard at all. The only thing that maybe needs to be added to conventional oral sedation education is some component of some hands-on type of approach. Because, you know, you, you get the certificate, you do the online course or whatever the case may be, you go home and then you're nervous about how people are responding to it. So from that perspective, you know, what we're, what we're going to do and what I'll talk about later is, you know, we're, we're going to have a segment of our surgical courses have people who are going to do oral sedation on those patients and get repetition and things like that done so they can get some hands-on experience. But the oral sedation in itself is very easy to implement because the cost to the patient is minimal. You can even do it for free in the beginning if you'd like. There was one year I looked at the reporting. I was like, I did $65,000 of oral sedation for free. Well, if you look at it from the perspective of how much dentistry did that allow me to do and how much goodwill did that get me with those patients, it's priceless in, in that respect. So from an educational perspective, the oral sedation is really easy to implement because it's just a handful of drugs. Like the cocktail I use, and I think maybe Brisky is pretty similar in this respect, but probably deviates slightly, is I do Valium the night before so they get a good night's rest. The Valium and the metabolites and those things are in their system when they come in because the half-life is what, like... 24 hours on that stuff. And so from that perspective, they come in the next morning, their MPO, the metabolites of the Valium are already in their system, and they take the Halcyon. And the Halcyon half-life is two hours. So then they work synergistically together. I'm going to use maybe Benadryl. I'm going to use like hydroxazine sometimes. And then that's the quote-unquote cocktail. And then the patients, you can either go oral or you can go sublingual. You can crush it up and put it in some water in a little Dixie cup and mix it up and have them drink it. But there's so many different ways to kind of administer that where the introduction of the you know sedation to the patient is very easy. If you get the right patient, too, you can crush it on a mirror and give them a dollar bill and they'll just put it right in their nose. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, bam. Yeah. If, it, like, See if they start rolling up a dollar bill, you better check their med history. <laughs> yeah, the meds may not work on that patient. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. Is I, I had oral conscious sedation. I followed the protocol and it's the same thing. It's Valium night before and then triazolam halcyon the next day i usually use hydroxyzine as well but i did this when i had to get like a lipoma cut off and i went in there and they handed me the gown they're like okay here's the gown you have any questions we're gonna leave the room and then you can get dressed and i'm like i'm good let's go and i just like took off my clothes and like right the the, the nurse still in there and he's like well we're not ready to start now i'm like let's go i'm ready now <laughs> and, and my wife was like my wife was like, you were out of your mind. She was like, that was so embarrassing. And I'm like, I don't, I didn't realize, like, I couldn't even like, and then I didn't barely remembered anything of it, which is crazy, but it, it was great. It was, it was a good experience. It was like, you know, no big deal. And then, and I wanted to try the protocol. I'm like, what do patients feel when, and I just, me and my wife went out to pizza. I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and, I went, 
And then you go to sleep and you wake up at like 6 p.m. You're like, where the hell am I? So uh, good stuff. It's a nice way to do that. <laughs> yeah. And so when it comes to the dentist, that's that's exactly what we want. We want them to, you know, not necessarily get naked in front of us, yeah. but more so than not, like not remember the appointment. And the amnesia component of the halcyon is is amazing. Yeah. I had a patient once and he said, because, because the Dahmer thing came out and everyone's watching the Dahmer stuff. And he's like, what do you give me? And I'm like, try Islam. He's like, isn't that the stuff Dahmer used? And I'm like, yeah, I think so. It is the stuff that I knew. I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe. He's like, yeah, I'll go, okay, I see what you're doing here. And I'm like, dude, come on. Come on don't do that. Wow, <laughs> a lot of Netflix. <laughs> he was the guy that we crushed it on the mirror for him. He was that type of guy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, so so it's easy to learn, and, and the protocols are – why don't you speak to like the the LD fifties of these drugs because I think that is a good thing to and I don't know you don't have to quote actually LD fifties but I think it's worth noting how safe like Halcyon Triazolam is and how how much you would have to give somebody to overdose them versus how much we actually give them to sedate them. You can only give a specific amount. This is an MRD, right? Your maximum daily, actually. So for Triazolam Halcyon, it's 0.5 milligrams. That is the maximum dose. So anytime you have a minimal sedation license, you one, you can't multi-dose technically, right? So you can't get more than one sedative med in a day. Then how you get around that is prescribing some volume the night before to make them a little bit relaxed, right? And that abides by all laws, thank God. But halcyon itself is pretty safe drug. You can have some respiratory depression. Yes, you can definitely do that. But that's at that point, if you have an, a fragile older woman, or actually a lot of times it's your heavy set guys, right? It's like you're really overweight guys sitting in the chair, big neck, and you give them 0.25 milligrams of halcyon. You're like, oh man, that even had a big effect on them. So I think you, there are some token patients that we would teach and you do need to identify who those people are before they come in the door. And if you do identify them, I think it is very safe. What do you think about treating apneics? It's it's difficult because they lay down, their neck is the size of a linebacker's thigh, and then they're going to obstruct. So you also want to be careful with if they're apneic, but are they relatively healthy or are they apneic and significantly overweight because you don't want to be holding their chin forward the whole time. Now, when it comes to minimal conscious sedation and they're guarding their own airway and they're not out for the count, you rarely see that unless you overdose the patient and you give them too much. And, it, it, you know, I'll touch on the pharmacokinetics of it and how it metabolizes and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, that's why kind of IV is sometimes a little bit more predictable. To touch base on your half-life, you know, question, I mean, just consider it this way, right? If the half-life of one drug or a drug is one hour, it takes about five hours to eliminate it fully from the body. So then when you have halcyon and the half-life is about two hours, it takes about 10 hours to fully eliminate the drug from the body to the point where it's not necessarily like present. But if we go farther up upstream, you know, at the end of the day, it's like there's the pharmacokinetics of it, right? And if you want to think about sedation from the perspective of what's happening, it's the whole body is going to be doing the drug, right? And so you have the route of delivery, you have the absorption, then you have the distribution within the body, the metabolization of the medication, and then the elimination of it. And so there's multiple routes of administration. You have the sublingual. So the reason why sublingual is important for dentistry is you can crush it up, crush it up on the mirror, but then hide the dollar bill, and then you have them lift up their tongue and you put it below their tongue. The reason why this is important is all the, the you know vasculature under there. It goes directly into the system. Versus, you know, if you take a PO or you take it, you know, orally, well, what's going to happen is, you know, the body has to process it. There's certain people where, you know, if they have like diabetes or they have delayed gastric emptying or the pH in their stomach, you know, is decreasing the absorption of the medication. All of these things will limit the ability of that person to respond properly to the medication. Or let's say like their blood flow is bad, their blood flow to the, the liver where it has to go and get processed is decreased from whatever vasculature issue they're having. They're going to not absorb the drug properly either. So from an oral administration perspective, you're kind of rolling the dice on this person. And of course you do your med history review, but they don't tell you everything where you got sublingual where it bypasses a lot of that. So that's why I like sublingual in the chair versus I like oral administration. It's slightly more predictable from that perspective. 
Yeah, and the thing is, is with doing oral is it's hard to titrate. It's not hard to titrate, but it's it's, it's the effect takes time. It's not like you you pump like a little bit of a drug in, in a line and then it's like, oh, okay, they feel it right away. It's like, okay, I think they need more. You give them some more triazolam. You put it under their tongue. You wait 30, 40 minutes. You know, was it good enough? I remember somebody I was today and she's like, I'm so awake. I don't feel anything. And I was like, okay, like I've already, I think I already gave her 0.75 triazolam already. And uh, I mean, you talk about the MRD being 0.5. And I gave her more, another one. And I want to say I crushed it up, put it under her tongue and came back like five minutes later and she was just out. She was just completely like zonked out, you know, and, and, and not, maybe slightly over sedated, but we just kind of like sprayed it under her tongue and sucked it up because I was like, okay, she didn't need that. But it, that's the thing. It takes time for it to kick in. She's like, I need more. And then all of a sudden she's like, done. Yeah. And, and I appreciate you telling that story because a lot of people don't get on podcasts and talk about like, hey, yeah, I over sedated that person. And with oral sedation, it's easy to over sedate. You know, I've come into the room, given them more, come back in and they're just like zonked because anxiety will override sedation and they come in and they're like scared and they're not sedated and they're fighting it, fighting it up until the point that they don't. And all of a sudden you get that maximum effect and then they're, they're out. You see, and and I'll, I'll add something that I've noticed is that this was before I was using hydroxazine as well. For me, hydroxazine, triazolam is the sedation. It is the one that's going to give the amnesic effect. Hydroxazine is what's going to actually make them go to sleep. And that's what I've noticed from my own personal experience. And I don't know what you guys teach. Yeah, my cocktail is hydroxyzine, Benadryl, triazolam. I know some people are doing Norcos and triazolam. I've done that like once or twice, and I found that they were slightly oversedated. It doesn't mean that that approach is wrong either. It's just whatever you're more comfortable with. And if we're talking about, you know, routes of delivery and time until effect, you know, oral sedation has a range of 30 to 90 minutes, and sublingual is three to five minutes. And then IV is, you know, sometimes 30 to 60 seconds. And I don't think a lot of us are doing IM or rectal administrations of medications. So <laughs> unless you rectal. are, maybe you're doing something wrong. No. Dude, I, I actually did have to prescribe uh, Zolfran, the back end insertion pill one time for yeah. a patient. because It was literally uncontrollable nausea and throwing up, like uncontrollable. Couldn't even keep a tablet down. And this was, this was a while ago. The anesthesiologist was like, I think we got to prescribe this. I'm like, what? What do we got to prescribe? I'm like, who's going to give the dose? (laughs) (laughs) Did you give the dose? No. You told him you got to wait till you get home to get the dose. (laughs) You know, I think we're making a pretty good point to like, hey, if we're going to get trained, oral sedation is good, but consider IV sedation. Yeah. Because you put the IV in and then you can use Versed, you can use fentanyl. In some states, you can use ketamine. In our state, you can't use ketamine. But I'm getting really, really nice results with, you know, the Versed fentanyl mix. Yeah. And, you know, and I want to touch on something is I, I talked about the LD50s, and I don't know if, if we ever said what they were, but I am pretty sure the LD50 on triazolam is something like like 20 milligrams or something like that, which would be 80 pills. It's a safe benzo. Like, you're not going to get to the point, like, ODing somebody but like you mentioned, Brisky, it, it's the more we give, the more respiratory depression we get. And that's why the people are, that's why your patients are monitored and that's why you're watching them. And they're not going to desaturate in, in, in two seconds. Like you're going to, you're going to catch it. And like, I've done an apneac as well. And I remember this guy, we, we did the whole procedure, but it was like every, man, I don't know, every 30, 40 seconds, we'd had to like pick his chin up and tell him to take some deep breaths. You know, it was just like, he just, Mm -hmm. it was stressful to an extent, but there was never part of me that was like, we can't, this is out of, out of my control, out of my hands. And I'm, I'm, I'm scared. And in worst case scenario, one thing nice about the benzo is, is you, it was a fluke. What is it? Uh, flumazenol? Flumazenol. Yeah. The flumazenol is, is an injection you can give sublingual and, and it, it'll wake him up right away. It's just the same thing as like Narcan for, opioids you know it's the same same kind of thing it's a blocker and it's a reversal agent so you've got enough safety there but let's just touch on this before we end this episode because i want to talk about i sent some of my i sent all my associates actually to a local class with somebody learning oral conscious sedation there was no hands-on it was all didactic i sent them a year ago not a single one of them has done a case even though i'm there to kind of help them guide them not a single one has done a case Talk about what you guys are offering at Colorado Surgical Institute, and and I love that you guys are doing the hands-on because I 
I agree with you is they never did the hands on. So they never got their feet wet and now they're not comfortable. And now it's just been too long since the course and they never implemented. And I'm still doing all the oral sedation at the practice. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that that goes hand in hand with a lot of things. Like when it comes to clinical work, we feel confident most of the time after like a course, but with sedation and it's new. And after you hear like half of the horror stories we just told here about all the. Yeah, we probably made it sound really scary. That's such a minority of the cases. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so like for the vast majority of the time, it's like, you know, one out of 20 cases, you're like, okay, maybe could have titrated that slightly differently. And the vast majority of the time, you're like, okay, I wish they were more sedated, but I got through the case. They didn't remember anything and everything was great, you know, because a lot of the times the patients are going to tell you, like, I'm not sedated enough. And you're going to tell them, hey, don't worry about it. Or you can crush up like a glucose tab under their tongue yeah. and like, you know, placebo them. And then they fall asleep because they think they got more. Yep. So there's so many different tips and tricks. But when it comes to Colorado Surgical Institute, we're running so many of these courses now and we have our wisdom tooth course and our single implant course and our full arch course. And so a lot of the times these patients are getting a form of sedation. So we're just going to dovetail our sedation curriculum and training within there. So if you have a sedation license like your associates and they, they want to come learn and get some hands on under our guidance and, you know, all I'd say the vast majority of the mentors are IV certified and we have some CRNAs who are there as well doing the IV sedations. We have a lot of backup there so you can see how these cases go. So you can titrate the doses can you, so you can interact with the patients and you can learn how to monitor these things. So we're just setting this up in a way to bridge the gap between the didactic knowledge everyone can get anywhere when it comes to oral sedation and actually making it functional so you can go home, apply it in your own practice, and actually get the benefits we talked about in the beginning, which is the increased revenue, the additional procedures, the higher production per month or per hour, and the confidence to do this in a way where you're not scared because it's, it's easier than you think. Yeah, and I think there's so many patients that want it. And if you offer it, this is what I've noticed as well, is if you offer it, even if you're offering it to just like onesie, twosies, just uh, two fillings, I mean, people want this service and people like this service and you don't have to just offer it just to the people that ask for it. You can create like a whole big practice on this and the people that are willing to pay for that are willing to pay for treatment. Just it's a different type of patient that doesn't care about the money. They care about the value proposition of getting their dentistry done comfortably. So when's your next class coming up, guys? So our uh, IV sedation curriculum because that's a longer set of curriculum. It's going to be uh, four courses. So essentially, it's three didactic. Two are going to be virtual. The first one starts in June. Then we have one in July. Then we have one in person where you you know do the mannequins and the phlebotomy, and you get comfortable with the veins, and you get comfortable with all the procedural stuff within the IV world. And then the fourth course is going to be your live patient curriculum that you're going to submit to your state boards and do the due diligence depending on whatever the state is. And so that's going to roll out in June. And then I would assume that probably in May or June, if people want to contact us, we can start adding the oral sedation component of it. But once we graduate our first class of IV docs, then we'll have the IV and oral sedation running kind of concurrently Mm -hmm. within Q3 and Q4 of this year. Awesome. Very cool. ColoradoSurgicalInstitute.com. Thanks so much, guys. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Dune from Colorado Surgical Institute. Just wanted to give you guys a shout out and let you know about the program. We have full arch surgeries. We have lateral sinus lifts. We have block grafting courses all done in one weekend with the whole digital workflow with photogametry units, scanners, 3D printers, milling, you name it, anything regarded to full arch, we cover in depth. We also have a PGCA course. What that is, it's the Postgraduate Clinical Accelerator course where we are going to be covering wisdom teeth, single implants, and it can be complex single implants with vertical sinus lifts. We'll also be covering full arch extractions with ridge reduction, bone grafting, PRP, suturing, and we also will have a course on socket preservation. So if you guys are interested in any of those courses, please reach out to us at Colorado Surgical Institute. The code is HERO10 for 10% off our courses because we love Paul Etchison and his podcast, and we're here to help.